G'day, I'm Mike Boris, and this is another episode of Straight Talk. And on the show today, no other than Lady Julia Morris. Some of the things we, we cover off during the chat are things like, really important one, relationship with her husband, Dan. How does that all work? What is that relationship? What are the dynamics of it? How important is it to her? And we do touch on a really important topic of menopause. Julia is really honest about all this, and she talks about how she has behaved and how she just couldn't control it. All right, now is the time for the no bullshit, Julia Morris. Lady Julia Morris, welcome to Straight Talk. I just could not be more delighted to be here. If anyone is a straight talker, Mark, let's face it, it is you and I. Yeah, bloody hell. <laughs> oh, okay. So, I mean, I guess for, for me, for me, for me, I mean, we know each other from the show, which is many, many years ago, um, and uh, you've done a million brilliant things since then, a million brilliant things since then. you produced this book, Julia Morris Makes It Easy. By the way, it's a... For me, it's a piss take. It's a total piss take. But it's, it's funny. Do you know it was halfway through uh, the lockdown last year and all of a sudden all sorts of people were coming out of the woodwork with their self-help. Hey, guys, you know what you should do? And that seemed to me like they were living really glorious lives and then telling the rest of us what to do. And I was so inspired that Dan and I wrote this together. We sat down and like... Dan being Julia's husband. husband. So the two of us... Long enduring, by the way, this fucking poor <laughs> bastard. Like a good, so but I'm a great more, chef. Anti all of those things, anti the motivation, anti the say yes and cancel, like all the things you're not meant to do. So, yeah, it's a total, total piss take. But, but, but it's, a, it's a comedic version of what people think that uh, what people during the um, lockdown thought was the self-help. Uh, yeah. you know, solutions to everything in fucking life and it's not, there's no such thing. Um, but people were like, you know what, my advice is amazing, guys. I'm going to share it with everybody because my chef gave me some great tips. We you like, what? Yeah, how to make what? sausages and mash. So yeah. uh, <laughs> Julia Morris, like I would say for me, looking from the outside, relatively speaking, I think you are fucking killing it, okay? But you have had an enormous 10 years let's say 10 years, around about that, um, an enormous period of time in your life you've been extremely successful. Everyone just thinks Julie Morris lives on Clover, but it's probably not true. People saying it about me, it's not true. I mean, I fucking work for it and I have extraordinarily challenging moments. Does that, how's, how does your life challenge you? When do you get challenged? By what? I am challenged by the, the nonstop work of it, which I not only love, I love, all my work, but there are moments like when I, we went to live in the States for a couple of years, I, I went to the Montreal Comedy Festival, was lucky enough to get an agent and a manager at the Comedy Festival and what happens when you're sort of starting to venture into the States side of things as an Aussie is that you meet everybody who says, you are the saviour of comedy, you have to move to Los Angeles and everyone gets tricked into, not tricked into, but enticed Seduced. by. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we moved to the States. I reckon our money ran out because I thought I'd be working in no time, Mark. I'm like, watch this. You know, a woman of a certain age that has experience, a new person that has these you know, 20 years experience. And Aussie. Yeah, stand-up comedy, all of that, relatable. And within three months I was having to commute home to Australia every five weeks to do some corporate gigs and some stand-up shows. To make a quid. To keep that afloat and then float back. So I guess I'm not the only one who makes sacrifices in that way. My whole family does. But when you talk about stuff like flying home every five weeks, it kind of like right up the back of the plane. It's got bumps on it. I mean, and people bang, bang, banging on the back of your head with their little screen. Um, now when I speak to performers, like, you know, how can, I, how can I get into TV? I feel like saying, mate, I wouldn't even know where to start. All I've done was um, start my big train and just <laughs> keep driving. So but is it just, but, yeah, but is it just, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm going to cop that, Julia. I mean, I think you've got to give yourself a bit of rap. I, I don't believe... Unless you've got some unbelievable people around you, like who's supporting you, apart from Dan and your kids, yeah. your two daughters. I mean, I'm, apart from that, I'm talking about m agents or managers or advisors or something, or it's just you. It's Dan it, and I. It's, okay. So it's not, can't be just, I'm just keep plodding along and, and keep pushing through. You must be sitting down thinking about these things. I think in the first half of my career, it really was plodding through. I was excited about earning that sort of money. I'd grown up in a house that was um, where both mum and dad had two jobs through my life. 
Uh, as in t- uh, two jobs each. Where did you grow up? Uh, in Gosford. Gosford, yep. So and Central Coast girl. Yeah. And then so I definitely had that example of hard work. Yeah, monkey see, monkey do. Absolutely. My parents did it, I'll do it. And I was always excited by money. I'm like, if I keep earning, then I, I don't know what I thought rich was, but interestingly now on this side of my life, there's no such thing as rich because you yeah. never quite get there because you're kind of like, so I always wanted to work to get more money, which sounds no effort equals reward. Yeah, yeah and a nice house, I've a new car. Bigger, yeah, bigger house, bigger, you know, a, a bigger flat, a bigger. Well, I think when you you definitely struggle in those early years of like, oh my god, like where is the rent coming from? I don't even know what to do, and that would have happened right up to and including living in London. I lived in London for eight years, and so there was plenty of broke times and plenty of broke times. On top of the what felt like the more flush times of money, but my mum and dad just worked. So, I, I just so what, do what do you what do you think you got from watching mum and dad in the central coast, both working two jobs each? Well, I mean, what was the lesson or the thing that you dragged into your normal life, you, the rest of your life? What did you get from that? Uh, keep on swimming, keep on swimming. Yeah. Like you know, yeah, yeah. They keep going. Had, they're so classy, my mum and dad. And still, they're still here. They're still alive. Yeah, they're still yeah. with us. They're actually uh, they're just across town as we speak. We're having the weekend together. Awesome. And 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 so they're still alive. They're still working. They're not working. They're both eighty five, but they did have a they. So one of the jobs that they um, shared was they cleaned an office at night. So they both. My mum was a bookkeeper, and dad owned a cab for a while, and then he was track manager at Gosford Race Club for. 20 years, I reckon, which meant that up at four, opening up for track work, brutal, brutal hours, but sort of home by 11. And then they go and clean a little office. And when a contract I was, cleaning business. Yeah. I well, sort that. of. Yeah. They just they had like two little offices that they go in and, and do whip around once a week. And they were kind of local friends that thought that they, mum and dad, could ha- have that job. You know, they were trustworthy, they were this, that. And even when I was on full frontal, I would then get the train up to Gosford on a Thursday night and go and clean with them because I wanted to make the job go more quickly for them. But they would never let me do any of the outside hosing because my mum would be like, What, what sort of offices the-? were they? They were just, um, uh, one was an accountancy firm and the other one was an eye doctor. Okay, can I get, uh, you know, my dad had a contract cleaning business too. Like he did it after work. Like he worked in a factory during the day yeah. and he did the contract cleaning exactly at night. Exactly the same. And when we were like 13 or 14, uh, I was the oldest in the family and then my brother had to do it, my sister had to do it at the same age. We used to have to go and help him and um, it was on Wednesday night and Thursday night. We used to get five bucks or something like this. It wasn't much, but we went to help him. I was happy to help him. But the thing, I don't know about you, but the thing I used to hate the most in those days anyway at least is that um, people smoked and yes. the fucking ashtrays in the office was always full of cigarettes and my job was to, to empty the ashtrays and I used to empty the ashtrays into the garbage tin and then I had to get the garbage out of the garbage tin and wrap it all up and put it down the back. And uh, and one of the things that used to piss me off, apart from that smell of cigarette Ugh. smoke. And on your hands. I used to get every. I smell like, but the thing that used to piss me off the most, and I can't, to this very day, it's a thing for me. If I saw, when I picked up their garbage tin, if I used to see bits of paper around the garbage tin, but the garbage tin wasn't full, I used to think, you untidy bastard. You know I'm coming here and my dad's coming in to pick up um, all your rubbish. You could at least throw the rubbish into the into the bin. Now today, if I throw a bit of rubbish in my bin and it misses and it lands on the floor, like it freaks me out. I have to pick it up pick it and up. Put, it, put it in the bin. And uh, did you ever did you ever experience that sort of shit? Mark, not only has it affected me in exactly the same way, I have an illness where if I'm at a hotel or if I'm at a service department or wherever I'm staying in Airbnb, I have to clean pretty much clean the place, not thoroughly, but leave it because I have this thing in my mind that when the cleaner comes in, they're going to be like, oh, who's been in here? And it's kind of one of those nice gifts to the universe for totally. free. But I think it comes from that time because of that Same. sort of level of respect for this is my parents. They're amazing. Yeah, yeah totally, 100%. Yeah. And, and, and how could you? How could you leave the mess? I mean, I, I, in hotels, I always leave five bucks, like oh, five, ten dollars. Just leave it there for the cleaner. I don't know why. I mean, I don't know if the cleaner takes it. Who knows? But yeah. They, but like, because I just, I, res- I actually respect cleaners so much. Do you know, we had a cleaner when, when, like, when I sort of got divorced and I, I, my kids all moved in with me, um, I had to have somebody to pick my kids up from school because I was work ridiculous hours when I was at Wizards. So, and we're living here in the city in Macquarie Street. And so we had a cleaner. 
at um, our wizard offices and in Castlereagh Street. And I said to him one day, I said, his name's Nick. I said, hey, Nick, how much do you earn per hour? He said, blah. And I said, uh, oh, okay, well, I'll pay you, this is $16.50, I think it was. And I said, I'll pay you 30 bucks an hour. Your job is to pick my kids up from school, drop them to school every day, pick them up every day. And, uh, and you can come and clean our offices here at another, in another building and I'll pay you 30 bucks an hour. And, uh, that was in, uh, two, uh, the year 2000, uh, today, 21 years later, Nick still works for me. He now cleans our office building here and I, I and I will never change that. He does my gardens. He lawns, mows my lawns. He's a Macedonian guy. And, uh, when I got him, I got his brand new, uh, S 500 Mercedes Benz. It was like, you know, top of the range car in 2004. I said, now look, Nick, um, you got to, you pick me up from the airport, drive my boys to school. This is a car, and he's. I remember he was driving the car, and he was sort of sitting in the car, and he was sitting really forward and sitting right over top of the steering wheel. And I was freaking me out. I was sort of sitting in the car with him as he's driving the airport. And I said, Nick, mate, I'm going to have to get you some um, driving like tuition type thing. And he said, Don't worry, in my village, this how we drive. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no fucking argument with him, like he, because he's a Macedonian. Like he eats rocks for lunch. This dude, he knows what he's doing. He's so lovely. Like, and and it's amazing that you've had that same experience. With, like cleaners to me are wonderful people. I always say hello to cleaners in buildings. I, no one else ever talks to them. I always say hello. I don't give a shit. And today, the new generation of people coming through, they're Indians, they're um, Sri Lankans, they're. Nepalese people doing the jobs in those days. It was up in your area. It was all the Aussies who were working class people did it. Yep, totally. And, and in my area, it was all the Wogs who did it, like mile men. So just oh, just recently, I was out at our at my local shopping centre is a shopping centre called Southland, kind of uh, east of Melbourne, and I went. I started chatting with a lady who was cleaning all the. Um, you know, the little tables where they have the little food part and we just started having a bit of a conversation. She said, you are the only person to speak to me today. Yeah, why not? Why I wouldn't said, you? What are you even talking about? She said, then some people come and have a go at me. I'm like, what, are, what is wrong with people? Now that human piece of Julie Morris, I, I want to just drop on that for a second, okay? And I, and I don't want you to get emotional, okay? No. But I, but you can get emotional if you yeah. want because I love to get on camera. Um, but... <laughs> But, but oh, Julia Morris, one of your successes or part of your success, my assessment of it is, is that you have that humanising empathy towards people. And, and I think, please tell me, is that important for a comedian in order to be able to get the comedy across? Oh, I think absolutely. Because, well, it is for what I consider is my brand of humour because I don't want I don't want someone sitting in the audience thinking I'm hating this moment. That's not what it's about. For, for my type of comedy and just the sort of person that I am, well, sometimes to my detriment I'm sure is that I have to uh, look after those around me and I don't know if that is something to do with the retired Catholic uh, so grateful that I must share because I still definitely do that in my life, as in, you know, oh, I need to look after you. Can I, can I fly you down? Can I do this for you? What can I do? And over the years I started to learn because of my family of four and because I am essentially the sole wage earner, I need to look after my party of four first and then there's the lots of things community. that I can do. Out. But there was, therefore, and I think you work out hopefully through your 20s and 30s who's on the take and who genuinely needs your help. So that's been a fun journey to work out who's who. But a bit of, like when you become, you, you know, just, I'll, I'll put it straight out, you're famous, you are famous, um, and when you are famous, you are going to get people to try and take from you. But sometimes it's, it doesn't really fucking matter. I mean, it's a bit like, oh, well, like if five out of every hundred end up getting the better on me, who gives a shit, at least 95 of totally. the right thing. You know, so you just hit on the word Catholic. Now, I went, my mother's Irish and I went to a Catholic school. Oh, my mum was Greek. He couldn't care less about the religion stuff. So, you know, mum, being a tough Irish woman, was like, like you got no chance. You could do what she says. That's I'm the it. same, raised by uh, uh, Irish women. Boom. You know, straight now, you know, like, you know, and all the old sayings like, you know, stop fiddling and diddling over there and get on with it and, you know, all that stuff. Anyway. Don't uh, arrive you, with your hands hanging. All arrive with you, the you got tickets on yourself. Get it, uh, get out of the, you know, all that. <laughs> yeah, so the wind. yeah, get out of the window. <laughs> so so, but but the point being, the point being here is, um, growing up as a in those environments, things like gratitude, um, 
being thankful. Um, uh, but they're very important uh, virtues, very important virtues. One of the things I get from you is that you are always very thankful and you are big on gratitude. I mean, yeah. you have a lot of gratitude for all the good things that happen. You, you appreciate things. I think things. it's the, um, the bell curve of financial life or the bell curve of life is that I have not got such a short memory that I don't remember wondering seriously where on earth the rent is going to come from in two days to um, now I have a property I can rent a, to someone. And you've got a portfolio. That's a huge leap. Yeah, but, and, and that's a – but that, but you've – my gut feeling is you feel gratitude for that. I mean, to the universe or wherever, it doesn't matter. And that's an important trait. Not many people have gratitude. In fact, a lot of people in you know who are famous become a bit arrogant. Um, oh, God. And- oh, do you know why? Because you're constantly asked about how you feel about stuff. You definitely get an inflated version of yep. – uh, I, I call it contribution issues. But you know what? I've got Dan. <laughs> I've got Dan in the house. So as soon as I get a little bit cocky, VIP. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dan's just like, really? But do you? I can't imagine you ever do. Um, every now and then I think you feel, I don't know. Yeah, there must be times yeah. when I'm finding myself fascinated. I remember f- when I had got two <laughs> jobs, uh, when I got the, um, I was doing Australia's Got Talent and I had house husbands. So I had those two shows going at the same time. And when that second show came on, I remember Dan saying to me, right, okay, you are, you're just about to go up to the next level in celebrity life, if that's what it is. And he said, you just need to remember that when you're, the difference between how you're treated at work and how you're treated at home are going to start to become wider and wider because at work you're going to be fascinating and the funniest person anyone's ever seen. Oh, my God, what did you say? That's an incredible idea. That's how it's going to be at work. When you come home, it's going to be like, uh, can you take that load out and put that into the dryer and the dishwasher needs doing while I go and pick up the kids or whatever. You're going to come right back down to family life and not actually be as fabulous or as fascinating as you are when you're at work. So what you kind of need to remember is this is one is the truth and the other one is uh, while it's a version of the truth, it's not most people are telling you what you want to hear, not what you need to hear. So So the genuine reality show is at home. Yeah. That's the genuine reality. Absolutely. And the rest is just sort of. um, Oh, yeah, when I'm picking up the dog's poo, I'm like, do you know what, guys, I'm a huge star. I did that last night. It's the best uh, of times. Uh, I, w- I walk around pork. Dan's got the shit. recipe where it, it literally goes hard, and then if you leave it overnight, it goes white. Well, I'm going to tell you what I do. I mean, this is this. I mean, this is really this is pretty bad, right? But uh, my gardener guy, the guy I was talking about before, Nick the yeah. Macedonian, he comes every Friday, which is today, right? But this morning and um, Thursday night, what I do is on Wednesday night, Wednesday morning, I don't. I feed my dog a big bone because when he does a poo. It comes out white, nice, and it doesn't come out like it's all runny. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's all and it's, it's easy to pick up. So, and then on Thursday night, I'm so worried about my um, Macedonian uh, garden guy who's. Oh yeah, Nikolai will turn. I have on to you. go and pick up all my dog shit. I can't let him do it, so I have to go around there in the dark. So last night I got home pretty late, and I was walking around in the dark with you know my, my clothes, obviously my clothes on, oh, and my wait, work well, clothes on. Stand by. I <laughs> love. <laughs> it's a bit overheating. No, work clothes. <laughs> have my work clothes, on. and I was fucking bending down the side of the house where he, the dog, he likes to go and do a crap around the, and I'm fucking picking up dog shit everywhere and filling in this plastic bag and don't tell the council, but I walk up the road and put it in the council bins because I don't want to put it in my bin. But I feel, only, the only reason I do it is because I don't want my poor cleaner to have to pick it up, my poor gardener Absolutely. guy to pick it up. Absolutely. And I go right down the thing for myself and give my dog bones so it's nice and white and it's easy for me to pick up the last bit So because I don't want it all more mushy like that. Hey, we shouldn't be talking about dog shit. Do you reckon so, part of that is to show, not to show Nick, but just to show the universe is that I'm not going to have Nick do anything that I wouldn't do. 100%. And, and by the way, and, he, and I'll go like one, not one step further, but I'll cross to the left. I actually say to myself, I will do what Nick does. Yeah. And I'm still, because I try to, look, my mother, who, uh, bless her soul, passed away two years ago from MND, I, uh, she would say to me, the, the, the worst thing that I could be to my mother in, in, in terms of her legacy is someone who thinks he is too good to do that. Yeah, and that's I, a disconnect. But that's got to be, is that part of the confidence of, but it's not for everyone, though. I was going to say, is that part of the confidence of being successful is I, f- I find the more successful I've got, the more honest I have been able to be about my very humble beginnings. I think when I first sort of burst onto the Sydney scene, uh, you know, as a young girl at sort of 20, I don't think I mentioned Gosford. And it wasn't long. I got onto Full Frontal, uh, the comedy sketch show, when I was about 24, 
And then all of a sudden, that must have felt like I was getting somewhere. So all of a sudden, I embraced where I was from. It's not like I was ever ashamed, but like mum and dad worked their absolute coits into the floor to get Brendan and I. My brother went to uh, Joey's and I went to over to Santa Sabina and Strathfield. Santa Sabina girls. I used to always how? like the Santa Sabina girls. Well, we're hot. Um, how was there that money? Like, yeah, how's yeah. the Cause, sacrifice? Cause relatively speaking, they were quite expensive schools. Joey's oh definitely was. God, yeah. They Brent must have put every dollar they earn into it. Yeah, they must have. I mean, this, uh, we, we still talk about those sacrifices, whether it's the lights not on as long or the... Um, turn the lights off a bit as you leave the room. Totally. Oh, Dad's like, when's the ship sailing? Yeah. Um, the other thing that my uh, mum and dad did was they we took, we took holidays 15 minutes from home because we grew up in Gosford and mum and dad had a lot of... Um, sort of professional friends, just that's how Gosford rolled in those days, and a lot of them had beach houses out near McMaster's or whatever. So not having the money to fly, they would lend mum and dad the house for the week and out we would go 15 minutes and that would be our beach holiday, same as flying to Queensland or whatever. It's still beautiful. So however they made that small amount of money work um, was a great lesson on trying to find things that uh, I don't have to take the children to Disneyland. I could take them down the road and just spend time with them and that will mean more. So th that's been a good lesson. But you probably lived your life like that anyway. I mean, you have lived yeah. your life like that. You and Dan have lived your lives like that. We've had to be frugal yeah. because there just wasn't, I think uh, where, um, people think about Australian celebrities where they're like, you're going to be on multi-millions, guys. And you're like, I'm a... <laughs> I'm a woman in show business in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Of course I'm on a lovely, decent wage when I work that hard, but, you know, it's not like I'm – it's not like I can stop working anytime soon. Yeah, and and, and, and you're 50 what, something? Three. 53. Whatever. So, this so, lighting is very, very so, friendly. It, it, well, it's got to be. I mean, they all say, you know, the best friend is your lighting, the lighting man. You've got to get in front of it. Absolutely. So, but can I can – do you consider yourself someone who is going to very soon want to retire or do you just want to keep working? No, no, put the money aside. What you need to do is, you know, you're going to need to be financially safe, I get that. But, and you may not be in exactly that position right now, but you will be some stage. But why do you work apart from that? I love it. Yep. It's fun. It is really good fun. Um, Do you reckon it helps your relationship? Not being uh, there every day. Being away, yeah. yeah. Coming and going, doing the fly in, fly out. Although I'm not as away. Obviously the last 12 months all bets are off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been in the home. Can you imagine? So Dan's got everything like working at home. It's all going beautifully. <laughs> and then I move home for 12 months. I mean, lucky Dan. And he's probably thinking, can you get Jesus the fuck out of here? Fuck, get, how do I start get, cutting? Get, what am I going to do? Yeah. Get back to work. And, and, well, but, Dan kind of handles all the business side of our business. Yeah. So. We made that decision, I think, around about the time, oh, uh, no, it's probably earlier, when we had babies, when we had babies, so our oldest is 14, maybe 14 years ago, and Dan said, I'm not really, sh at the time, he was working in advertising for um, Young and Rubicon in London, and he was sort of saying, um, um, I don't really know what my dream is, so let's focus on yours for a while, and if mine floats to the surface, I can have a turn later. And we'd not long had a baby and he'd been working crazy hours and hadn't seen the baby in sort of three months. You know, that sort of leaving before the baby wakes up, the baby's in bed by the time you get home, that sort of feeling. And then I got this opportunity to come and do a show in Australia. I said to Dan, do you want to have a little swap of roles for three months? I'll go out and work at this show, which will get us enough money. It was always enough money to get through the next bit. That's how it feels. Well, that's showbiz. Absolutely. And also, you know, we talk, We sort of, um, we, we, I know we mentioned the word in reinvention, but that trying to stay relevant, relevant, which I think for me has been a little bit luck of the draw that I've been overseas and then coming back. You seem new each yeah, time. Yeah, you're fresh. Yeah. So when Dan decided to take over that side of things, I mean, Dan's a super smart guy and he had a sort of similar upbringing to me but he he was grown up. Like he went to university and he did philosophy and he did <laughs> masters in business. So between those two things, I have a very reasonable human being in the house. And I always joke, I said to him like years ago, if you ever leave me and you take all the money, I just want you to know you've earned every single penny of it, my friend, every I will rise again, but you, sir, 
Would you would you could you describe your relationship as you cut he sews? Yeah, absolutely. I, that's a great way of saying it, actually. And also, we have that time period where once a year, I'm we're both looking at one bedroom apartments and thinking, how are we going to split this up? Like once a year, I reckon you feel like how you you split up. I reckon once a year you feel like divorcing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. And we're in our what we call our corners. We like, and you, how dare you? That sort of stuff. And then we have a little session with the psychologist together. And do you rip in? Do you rip in? Oh. Uh, can you imagine how fascinating I find myself, yeah, Mark? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I honestly, it's like the fucking Urshel of the sea witch rising from the bow. And he's just slumming. He's like, here, here we go. But also, he's a pest too. So between the two of us, we have that pesty moment. I'm like, what if we could just have an apartment in town that we could go to where I didn't have to listen to you? And then within a few weeks of addressing it, so we'll go in and see the psychologist together. What's your problem? What's your problem? Are you actually like a therapist? Type? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. And then that somehow makes you go, oh, yeah, I am being a bit of a dickhead. And he is like, oh, yeah. So uh, the problem that we have is that I'm too loose and Dan's, uh, so t- Dan tightens the noose and I'm too loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as soon yeah, as yeah. I start, because I get home from a big job where almost someone's almost been lifting the coffee to my mouth. Yeah, yeah. Like that's how. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And my every whim is taken yeah, care yeah. of, even though I don't pick her up in the car. It. She's on there. Drop, totally. Drop, yeah. Then you get home, and and Dan's just like, Ugh. you yeah, know, she is. yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm just like, it's going to take me another week at least to get back into the swing of home life. <laughs> it's like, yeah, how about you got about four minutes to get back into the swing of home life? Go and pick up the children from school, please. Yeah, and, and well, how do the kids deal with that? Like, uh, do the kids ever? Let's say you're. I mean, when you when you're on set, like you're away filming. Say I, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. You wait, you know, you're on, you're you're at the location. Yeah. How do the kids do with not seeing mum for? They a long come. Time? So if it's oh, okay. more than four weeks, the family come. Were well, you homeschool? Stay. Or no, they just come for a week. Which if it's say, um, like say the jungle is six weeks, mm-hmm. so after three weeks they'll come and have a week, and yep. they've only got two weeks left till I get home. Right. Okay. But that can't be easy either. With no, no. Mummy, I think no. now that they are. Because, you know, sort of in earlier in that first 10 years, it's all scheduling, yep. isn't it? Yep. It's dropping off to this, go to gymnastics, pick up that one, do this, da, 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 da. So it's all scheduling, get them to bed by a certain hour, even though there's nurturing, obviously, and also I am there. Of that, say, six weeks, I then won't work for another four months where I'll do the odd corporate or I might step out or not really much. She's available for the odd corporate. By the way, it's available. I <laughs> she is available, Okay. <laughs> She My has an agent. She's doing she less and less these just days. Just ring Dan and he'll give you a price. I was literally um, uh, just saying before that I've, I'm definitely starting to wind things down to the necessaries. I'm no longer in that place where I have to say yes to everything. To everything because I'm scared of where the next job's coming from. And actually, Wendy Harmer told me years ago, Love years Wendy. ago, she said something like, You've got your seat on the bus. So some, sometimes you're going to be earning less, sometimes you're going to be earning more, but you are essentially. You know, as a comic in Australia, you are known. Yep. So that ebb and flow, don't forget to uh, don't miss life. You know, if there is something at school, don't don't take work then if you can avoid it. Make sure you're there for graduations. Make sure you're there for all of those things. So you things. have backfilled. So you keep backfilling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's how – because, I mean, a lot of people are really busy in whatever the business is, people who listen to this, this show, and they're, they're trying to work out – they're always oh, the life, life balance, I mean – that's I, bullshit. I, I, totally bullshit, right? Like, but but you do have to backfill. Yes, because you have obligations. Yes, to whoever it is, and you have to backfill. And when you get an opportunity, like in your case, you might get two months off. I mean, two months when you're not working intensely. Yeah, and, you're and the then odd. and then I'm, I'm making the calls or doing the writing or getting ready for the next thing. So when I call that time off, you're still you're not you're not not doing nothing, but yeah. you have time. You have flexibility to go and pick your kids up from school or go and do Yeah, I'm not doing training. a 17-hour day. Yeah, and by the way, I, 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 so you backfill, and I think it's really important here because most people who watch all these various shows, TV shows, don't have a clue how this all works. So can I ask you how long – just pick one of the series. Um, yeah. Is it like – let's say it's a – So The Jungle, ten, for example. Ten, how many episodes that? How many episodes? So for The Jungle we do around about 23 episodes. Okay, so how long does 23 episodes take to film? So when we're in Africa it takes six weeks to film and for those six weeks, five days a week we will be between 12 and 
Kona, some days, 17 hour yep. days. Yep. So you're up at six, you finish at six in the night, or you could go to 11 p.m. that night. Absolutely. Five days a week? Yeah, five days a um, week. When we shoot in Australia, because of the time constraints we have with the set here in Australia, we will do 26 days in a row. Yep. And those 26 days in a row, the final eight days will be 17 hour days. Yep. Only for Chris and I. Uh, all the crew are governed by other rules and 10 hour turnover and whatever. But yeah, but you, you're, the, you're the talent. Oh, yeah. You, you, have, you have to be available also, the whole time. You know it's coming. So you've got a certain responsibility to be a uh, fit for it and, yep. you know, instead of halfway through the shoot being like, I can't believe I'm having to work a 17-hour day. It's the difference that I'm hearing between y- how younger people talk about their work, like say Ruby is 14, my eldest, her and her girlfriends are uh, sort of up to 18, I guess, and they, they're they like 17 hours. You're like, mate, not only 17 hours but everyone would appreciate if you didn't whinge because you still have the glory job of being in a oopsie, being in a nice outfit, <laughs> you know, walking onto set and chatting and being fun. So you, it's not like I'm on the railroad. Yeah, you're not but, digging up holes. Um, but at the same time, it's a bit of a punish. I mean, I've been through it two years, you know. Like, it's a bit of a punish because it always everyone goes, "Oh wow, you're looking." Is Julie looking all glamorous? But you fucking stand there, and they've got a oh, you've got a mics on, and you got shit all over, you, and they're putting makeup on you, and they're fixing this. And, and it's and, forty-five degrees and at five o'clock off in the afternoon, and everyone's touching you all and day. Get the fuck away from me, like, <laughs> But you have to be nice, absolutely. Yeah. Because and you got to be. And in your case, you got to be funny. Ah, oh, everyone's doing their jobs, and then. Cut to lady of a certain age, the fist of fury that rises within you, which is completely unreasonable. <laughs> There's this weird thing that I feel happens, and it's not not all women experience it, but you hit this apex of your career and all of a sudden you are so angry and unreasonable having spent a whole lifetime working actively towards being reasonable is that because and helpful. Of your age? Do you think that's just uh, – bi- is that biological you're talking about? That's menopause. Yeah, menopause. So you're talking – because that's an interesting thing to talk about for a second. So what you're saying is you spend your whole lifetime building and pitching your career until you get to this pinnacle. See how easy going I am, guys? Yeah, and then yeah. you get to like, and you're like 50-ish yeah. and all of a sudden oh, bi- the biology starts to kick down in. down the hatches, Mark. And you think, if I had a fucking gun – Oh, thank God <laughs> – Passionate, I'm getting. Thank God the gun laws are safe. So, I, I could have shot 50 people and just did this morning. Well, I can tell you something. I've been like that my whole fucking life. I hadn't didn't have to wait for any menopause or manopause. Yeah. But 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 but, but that's amazing. And so, how do you deal with that? What, what do you do? Do you um, give yourself an uppercut and say, "Sit down, Julie, and be, I, stop being a punish." I had to. So that's when I started to consult a psychologist because I didn't. I don't know that I knew that ladies could go on to uh, HRT or whatever that was. I wasn't informed because it felt like an old people's disease to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, yeah. Oh, now that at my age, that's incorrect. So I, I find it fascinating women in business and, and women in business, like grown-up business like what you do, is that they all, their whole working lives is, you know, see how reliable I am, see how good I am in meetings, all of this, working, working, working to this pinnacle of your career and that's when you turn psycho, even if it's for two years. Can, can you just talk, I mean, obviously I don't know, but like what, what, what would happen, for example? What would happen to you? What would you get a? a, a you like come what with the f- fuck do you mean by that? Oh, sorry. Do you know what I mean? Shit. That's what happens, mate. Get rid of Can't that one. Sugar, put you up there. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it is like oh, I, I call it like f- fist of fury. But it just it comes in. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, because it starts with say, um, um, uh, uh, let's think. I'm just trying to think of an example where someone's made me cross. Like, for example. Uh, You'll be out and about, and someone will be like, oh, you, can, you can't do that. You've got, please don't speak to me. You don't, you've got nothing to do. <laughs> you've got nothing to do with me. And for example, I've got a good example. Getting onto the plane yesterday, and I go to uh, check through the actual bleep bleep to go down the thing onto the plane. And the chap says, um, you, what, what age are your children? And I'm like, they are 12 and 14. So I was feeling all right. I'm actually past it and I'm off back to the reasonable part. But, my God, I reckon for nearly three years oh, I could have stabbed someone. I could, I could have punched someone in the throat and taken the, the trachea out with my own hands, <laughs> out of control. I love it. I'm in Lucky Dan. And so the chap says, um, well, you've, you're in the exit seats. You're not allowed to be in the exit seats. You have a, you have a 12-year-old with you. And I'm like, um, mate, I've got that's nothing to do with me. I've just booked a ticket. So. That, I think that's your system. Well, you can't put children into that area where those seats are. And I'm like, 
Okay, so let let's just, just take a moment. I can feel <laughs> here comes fist. And I feel the girls are like, here goes mum, she's going to have a fork. Oh, they, they, yeah, yeah. they know it. Fork in, Ellie, here we go. So I'm like, man, um, okay, so what I've done is I've just booked three tickets for three adults because you charge an adult fare for a 12-year-old child. So then you allocate my seats and now you're going to have a little go at me because I, the seats are seats that you don't think I should be in. Is that what's happening at the moment? So I get really fucking smart arsey yeah. and the guy's like, you shouldn't be in these seats. I'm like, mate, okay, I've given you two chances to take this down. <laughs> <laughs> so then I just a slight more volume but still trying to be polite because I know he's also doing his job. But he's, I'm like, it's your system, mate. But you sort could, your but system you, out. you're saying you couldn't control it though, are you? Oh, you, oh, so during the full menopause I feel like it's very difficult to control. Having seen the psychologist over that time of the menopause, just going like, "Oh my god, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fucking slap someone to death in the street," and she was, she would talk me through, "Okay, here's here's that situation, here's what went wrong, here's where that moment, you could have just been like." So in that moment, my brain now will say, "We're getting on this plane in a minute." Doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. Move me here, Pull move me there, do not matter. Yeah. Whereas, say, two years ago when I was in the height of it, I'd be like, don't you tell me to move seats, <laughs> I, you know, that sort of. And, and, and can I, how does that affect you then when you're, when you're on set? Like, oh, my or God. Or you're trying to be funny or That's whatever. That's a question for Dr Chris, I reckon, because poor old Dr Chris had to, Dr Chris Brown, yeah, yeah. he had to ride, I reckon, two good years of it where he'd be like, good morning, how are you? And I would literally be, what the fuck do you mean by that? Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Why are you so happy? Oh, he'd be like, <laughs> whatever you need. Is he so, a nice guy? Oh, my God, he's lovely. Is he? He's, he's like a scientist in a zip-up handsome suit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> zip-up handsome suit. I like that way. So he doesn't see all that bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. He just is fascinated in the veterinary science. He's a, an amazing photographer and he's a, he's a real gentleman. He's the real deal. So that worked. I mean, whoever cast the two of you obviously sort of knew a little bit about Julie Morris and they got, they got the casting right in, in terms of the know, talent. Um, well, this is The Jungle's the first show where I feel like any of the networks have just uh, let the balloon go, where they're like, you just do you. Whereas in years gone by when I've hosted things, people have been like, can you turn, mm, you're very, you're a lot turn that down or now you're too sullen, please turn the volume up on your personality. Turn down, turn up, turn down, turn up. Whereas The Jungle was the first time when and with Channel 10 they were kind of like just do what you do. I feel like that's what we have bought. That's what we paid for. And I'm like, oh, no, you would, it seems so simple. You, you've bought this product but now you want to make it sensible. You're like, mm, you better go and get a sensible host. So the jungle's the first time I feel like they've really let me be me uh, in this in that the reality format. And although um, on Apprentice we were allowed to be ourselves. Yeah, I, but, but look, I used to watch some of the stuff, and I used to always say, "Look, I'll be honest, with you, one of the, one of the really important lessons we learned from that series when you were in it." Was and we try to replicate it, but we had no luck. I mean, we try to get Vince to do it one year to be Julia Morris, but Vince is not Julia Morris in real life. I mean, Vince is is just not you. You're you're crazy all the time. Vince isn't. Vince is just crazy on stage. Um, but the thing that we got from you is that whenever the show was getting dull, especially we just get a voxy of you, and uh, and you'd nice. you, you you in the edit because when you're doing the edit, you always need some flow and something to break up monotony. And, uh, yeah. and Julie Morris always good. We thought that was because you're a comedian. That's why we then try to get a comedian on every show after that, but it didn't work. It's it's something else about Julie Morris. Julie Morris has an energy that she brings with her. Um, and and I, and I wonder, and, I, and I'm saying Julie Morris in the third person mm -hmm. as opposed to you, because I wonder whether that's um, you in real life. And uh, at home, for example. Oh, no. That's not like that. So it's Julia on set, Julia in business. I figure if you're out, you're on. Yeah, so that's so Julia in, absolutely. In, in, in a performance sense. Well, even in life. So if I'm ducking down to the station, I'm going to have a laugh with the chap who's selling me the ticket. Then, or if I'm getting an Uber into town, I'll have a nice conversation with that But when chap. is on? What is on to you? Like, uh, on what? is trying to be the best, best version of myself. Yeah, so uh, you have assessed who you yourself is. You know who, yeah. you know who Julian Morris is relative to Dan or relative to the rest of the world? Um, 
When I'm at home, like there's lots of laughter. Dan and I have a very similar sense of humour, so that's that's wonderful within our our relationship. Sarcasm, piss take. Oh yeah. Oh, and also something's wrong. Uh, humour is often that way to be like, oh, how you know, how's the dishwasher working out for you, yeah, or yeah. you know yeah, that yeah, sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without it being nasty. And years ago, I remember Dan saying in the home. He's like, uh, we need to actually have a think about the way we're talking to each other at the moment because at that, at that time we were, um, oh, well, I think you can do it actually. Do you, do you want to do it? That sort of smart ass to each other where yeah, he yeah. said uh, after a little while that's going to build resentment to a point where we just can't see each other or connect. So let's, let's try and be careful with the way we speak to each other at home because I think when you're out you can have all this happiness out and about but even Dan said at the time, that was a few years ago, he's like, you know all that sugar that you've got when you're out with people? Hello. He's like, you could just bring a tiny, a tiny whisper of that home Fuck for me, us. I think Dan's a psychologist. Oh, Dan's the guru. No, I'm serious. Oh, Dan's the guru. I'm telling you. If, no. it, if it goes wrong, it will be me who fucks it up. There's no, but, no two but ways about it. But it won't go wrong because Dan's not going to let you fuck it up. That's no, the whole point. No, he's also like, we're just like, we're gonna, we are, I'm hoping that we uh, live to to be old people together. How many years have you been married now? Um, we've been married for fifteen years together for twenty years. Or my sixteen for <laughs> twenty one. Um, I would send down a text. But my phone is in the other room, but he, he will tell. You know, us. you're not watching this, are you? Then hopefully, Dad will love it. He'll just be like, "Do I sound amazing?" Yeah, well, he is a fucking. Amazing. But he's not interested in all the show business side of stuff. So, like, if they if if we're approached by someone to do a story, he's like, "Baby, please." I'm I feel out. like a dickhead. Yeah. Or like I feel like Dennis Thatcher holding the handbag. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and he yeah, couldn't yeah. be further from that. He's like, um, in our friendship group, Dan's the superhero. I'm like a featured extra. Uh, you know. I'm, yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. is beloved in our gang. Well, so. I, mean, I don't know him other than I have spoken to him once or twice over the telephone. But um, I, I sort of love the bloke, and I don't even know the dude. Um, I have, like physically haven't met him, but he, he, he sounds like a. Fucking gem. Anyway, we're going to, by the way, just get wound, wound up for the break. I've got to go to the break. We're going to come back from the break and we're going to, I want to talk about this. So you're something really important for business owners because you're in business for yourself. Yeah. You're a self employed person. I want to talk to business owners about the concept of in branding, and Julia Morris is a big brand, the concept of relevance and how, how, you know, how one can reinvent themselves to be relevant and how one remains relevant. So it's continually reinventing just little bits, little bits, little bits, what it takes to do that, how you do it and how you think about it. So let's go to the break and we'll come straight back. Being in business is fucking hard. And at the end of the day, all your time, effort, money and sweat and blood and tears has got to amount to something. Since beginning of this year, when I held my first masterclass, I have been sitting down and writing out my playbook, which I'm now sharing with you. Yeah, I've experienced some of the greatest business minds in this country. All of those experiences are in this playbook. I'm back at Straight Talk. Julie Morris, Lady Julie Morris, I'm oh. sorry we must be formal about this. First thing I want to talk about though is your brand. I mean, you really Apart from you being a brand, you have a delivery, you've got content and you've got to work on the content and I'll get to that in a moment. That's your product. But your brand is Julia Morris or Lady Julia Morris. It's Instagram. It's prob I haven't seen on Facebook, but I get this. It's Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's new books like this. It's TV programs. It's it's uh, bouncing in every six talks, months in some other form. And it's doing a whole lot of different things. But to do that successfully, you've got to be relevant and you've got to know your audience. And the jokes you told 20 years ago, you can't tell now. Absolutely. Um, and, there's a, and there's also an expectation about your, from your audience about who you are. And in some of the cases, your slight nuances are different, Julia Morris, in different shows and in different audiences. But how, does, how did Julia Morris, for a start, originally reinvent herself before she got big on television? Like, tell me, take me through that process. What was the thinking? I mean, I remember, I remember you came on, on The Apprentice, and The Celebrity Apprentice, and I think you were in America prior to that. You mm -hmm. came here and, you know, look, the bottom line is, I mean, I don't, I'll say this, people go on Apprentice because they want to fucking reinvent themselves. Totally. That's, that's the deal. Absolutely. I'm sorry, that's the deal. 100%. I, I, I'm not sure that I wanted to reinvent myself. I wanted the wage. Yeah, you, we need, you need to quit. The States. Yeah. I, it was a bit disposable to me when I signed on. Yeah. It only started to mean something halfway through the show. But 
When I won that show before it went to air, so there was this little period of time, there would have been about three weeks, and at that time I changed. For performers, we often have a bit of a business shake-up every time you change an agent, which is not that often. You, I, I'm, most of the time I'm with someone for seven years and then I just sort of drifts and I'm ready for a new injection. It might not be seven years, might be four years, sometimes it's two years. But when Apprentice happened, um, I had been away for the best part of 10 years. I'd had eight years in the UK, two years in the US. And I, when we came home, The Apprentice, we knew, I felt like this was a wave that we needed to surf or ride, whatever the expression is. And so um, Dan had the idea of going out to market and working out what was the perception of me with production companies and with the network. So you did some research. Yeah. And... And I guess when you are a third party is asking, I'm not asking people, do you like me? It's not like that. What it is is why will you or why will you not employ Julia Morris? And lots of really cool stuff came to the surface like Julia will do everything so there's nothing much very special about that. So that's not someone who gets into a lead role as a host. That's someone who's going to go on a panel of six. Yeah, yeah. So. Starting to learn when to say no in business. We do not need to do that, but I do need to do that. I mean, that's years and years and years of working out that the the no is the most important part of my business. Because before that, as a worker and as a child of workers, just think if you're saying yes, you're doing the right thing. So years prior to that, I'd just gone on any show, didn't matter, no direction, Whatever, I'm working. Here's another nice fee. Um, but after Apprentice. But what a damn so what a damn workout before and during the show, Apprentice, that Julia Morris should stand for or should represent or. or well, the, the, it had been the first, Apprentice was the first show where I could, where people got to see me. Yeah, yeah. So before that, I'd either been in interviews where I would have been, hi, Octane, I'm trying to sell it to her. This will be whether we eat or not for the next month. So you get, Wah! you get big the big lady. Um, And so The Apprentice was this moment where I could just speak to people. All my friends used to say, I wish I could just see you in a show like when we're in the lounge room because you are, you know, so full of great suggestions and ideas and whatever, but we never get to see that. And energy. You get to see high octane version. But you've got energy, like it doesn't have to be a high octane version of energy, but there's an energy coming from you all the time. It can be warmth, energy, energetic warmth. I knew you were going to win it as soon as I met you. As soon as I saw the show, after about a week or two, I don't want to, like, this is not very nice for me to say this, but I, I knew in my mind I think she's going to win the show. And I knew that when other, I, I generally speaking know who's going to win the show after two or three weeks. In my mind, and I don't, I don't want anyone to think the bad thing that I pre-convinced myself, preconceived it. Channel Nine doesn't influence it. Well, not only that, it's yours to lose, isn't it? For the contestants, you, you can fuck it up. It's yours to lose, totally. And I can tell you, I never saved you, never once. I never tried. I didn't think. I don't think I ever tried to save you ever. So I never got into the second boardroom. Yeah. I never yeah. made it into the whoopsie. We're all going to yeah. go in our boardroom. So what did you? What did you? I mean, what did you learn about yourself in terms of your relevance as a brand? What What did you get from that? What do you? Th- did you find that uh, people like me because of blah blah blah? Therefore, I should take that and amplify it outside of the show. It was. Um, I th- I got through the apprentice experience. I got confidence in my gut. So whatever the gut was that I followed. Uh, and I remember somebody saying, look, all you need to do is if you if you fucked up, you just need to look at Mark and speak to him honestly because mm. people do fuck up. Mm. So that's okay. doesn't matter that it was wrong. You're not going to get fired because it was wrong. How are you going to now take the experience to either learn from it or make it better? So any time that I felt like I hadn't done the right thing. All I tried to do was be honest as possible. And I know you and I have spoken about honesty before, about it sets you free. Totally. Um, I know in business. And people should do that in business too, generally. Absolutely. Uh, well, it's it, well, nobody's ever say, saying they're struggling. Yeah. Or reaching out at a time and then all of a sudden your business is imploded because you, what, you weren't gutsy enough to say, actually, I, I don't think I'm help. very good at this. So... And um, following your own gut and knowing what you're doing, but also being able to, uh, you know, say uh, I'm not good at this or 
I, I fucked up. I've made a huge mistake. How how do I make this better? And and willing to learn it rather than the nothing to do with me. The the odd. It was over here. It was this her or him. This bl- oh, the blame game. Yeah. Is breathtaking. While yeah. no one takes responsibility for anything, it does my hairy nut in. Yeah. But by the same token, I had also remembered you saying something about don't take responsibility for something that's not your fault. Yep. As well, instead of just making oh guys. I'm just going to say this is my fault so no one gets into trouble. Oh, yeah, yeah you're fine. Yeah, that's bullshit. For being an totally. idiot. Totally. Yeah. So there was lots of lessons that I learned through that show um, to have more confidence in um, maybe the grown-up side of me rather than the free to fun bags side. And, and, and that became, I think that became your brand. You became like a... You became, look, in television terms, you became really good talent. You, well, you showed us that you're really good talent and nine picked you up, I think, straight away. Yeah, and I think before that nine thought that I was. Um, Julie Scatterbrain. Oh, just uh, like another one of those girls who's yeah, yeah. just like, you know what, I just really yeah. love Kashmir. Yeah. I think that they thought that's all that there was to me and certainly The Apprentice started a great love affair with Channel 9. I worked with them for ages and had a really, really positive experience. So, but, and, and, and in terms of keeping that yourself relevant with Channel 9, I mean, I mean I, people talk about pivoting and all that sort of stuff, but I mean, the, the various changes in your, um, let's call branding or how are you on? Do you sort of sit down and talk to Dan and say, okay, well, that's one year working with Channel Nine. I did this show, blah blah blah. It was pretty good. Um, my audiences were good. I earned a good quid. But I, you know, next year we're going to do the show again. Um, Dan, what do you think? Do you and Dan sit down and sort of analyze maybe how you got to like just change a little bit or change Definitely. it up or change it down? And also the plans for where do we want to be next year? Yeah. So this is fine, but this will run out. Yeah. So whatever I'm working on at the moment, eventually. The jungle won't be around anymore. There's one big chunk of wages yep. that will be gone. So um, it's keeping uh, those income streams, certainly as a performer, w- working out. So like last year we were locked down, we wrote a book. I, I, we weren't allowed to perform essentially for a year. I had to move my tour and eventually cancel it. And you didn't know long how, that lockdown, how long the lockdown would go for either. Well, uh, you know, it's been just the weirdest sort of, you know, 12 months for all of us. Um, but trying to plan... Which I don't think you can plan. Sometimes you do, do just fall into the next moment happening. But Dan and my agent usually work side by side and then they'll loop me in when the work needs to be done, if that makes sense. Yeah, they'll yeah. be like, you know what, do you want to do this sort of thing? Or like say, for example, this year um, I was hoping with so many movies being made that I might be able to get a little walk-on role in a movie somewhere. So I've purposely left some time clear to be able to do that. So oftentimes those things come up at the drop of a hat and then you've got to go next week and film for two weeks. Especially with Netflix and Stan and all the other, these like local content. Absolutely. Uh, uh, platform, platforms. And I can see that. And is, is that because there's something you want to do personally? Like, uh, Yeah. So that's, fill, um, that's yeah, filling up my the heart bucket rather than just the, the money cash bucket. bucket. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah which yeah. I'm also happy with the cash bucket at all times because the cash bucket allows for – um, more time off with the family. It allows for um, obviously, as we all know, just greater freedom. In more choices. Life. Absolutely, but um, I, I don't know. In terms of, of um, pivoting as well, I think you. I think there's an expression called a super feeler, and I think that I've got a little bit touch of that, which is the I'm very conscious of when my time is up. I want to see it. I don't want to be shocked and furious in the car park that I've been let go. I want to understand that that was my time and it doesn't last in show business. But how do you do that? I mean, do you, I mean, do you, do you go and talk to, um, do you go to have meetings with Mike Sneesby, the new CEO of General? I mean, how do you find out or do you get, or do you get it by walking through the shopping centre and you, all of a sudden people don't respond to you very well? Or do you think it's, well, how, do you, how do you get this sense of, when your time is up. Yeah. I don't know. And I think so if I want to transition to the next part of life, so this is, you know, we've got a wonderful influx of ladies in their 50s hosting big shows on television at the moment, unreal. But when I'm 60, I don't, I'm not really sure that that's going to happen. So now we're sort of in the planning stages of what do we do next? What do we want to do next? So drama is an area where uh, ladies in their 60s are going to be allowed Dr- to work. Drumming, Drama being theatre. Dr- uh, no, as in um, movies, as in series, yep, yep. kind of like House Husbands yep, yep. or um, 
And the other thing is in the in the public speaking arena, like I do host lots of awards nights and functions like that. That's another part of the income stream which has been taken away over the last 12 back months. Back now though. And the other thing is working out if we're going to have, very much back now, if we're going to have a, a good earning period is socking it away, not changing our life that much. Because really once you get to a certain stage in your life, you've got a toilet that works Yeah. and uh, hopefully – a bit of warmth in the house and a nice comfortable couch, it's only incremental changes with more, 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 more money, isn't it? Just a bigger place to clean. So trying to not go all spendy mad so that the second half of our lives, which I feel like has really already started. Not going to be under pressure. Oh, yeah, so that we can do but, something and, and not have to. But at the same time, better than what you had at Gosford. So. Oh, so, like, it's this balance. I mean, and of course, to me, I mean, you said right at the very beginning of the this, this show, like, about um, Rich, to me, Rich is about understanding, first, the first part of Rich is understanding what you actually want. And you'll never understand that when you're young um, you'll, cause, because Rich is relative to when you're older. So, like, it's a thing you need to be when you're older, Rich in, in the sense of comfortable. I guess, and also health is really... Your riches are in your health yeah, because yeah. while you, whatever you're healthy, you can keep working. So my, I'm not on a trip. I'm not on a journey to work out when I can finish work at all because I love work. It's a really big part of me. Because um, if you didn't couldn't work today for, for whatever reason, no one decided. Julie Morris, she's oh, oh, we don't want to have her anymore. How, what would you do? I would be as happy as a lark. Do you know what? I'd probably, I don't know, become an, um, a flight attendant. I don't know. I'll just do something where I'm allowed to talk because it'll kill Dan. If you put me in the home, I just won't stop talking and he will be ready to hari kari. So um, I feel like if, if it all stops tomorrow, I don't know, I don't really want to do anything. Well, I, I had a, phone, a conversation yesterday with a, a friend of mine, James Simon. He's James is John's nephew. James is the CEO of Aussie Home Loans. Hmm. John was the chairman of Aussie Home Loans and they were CEO and chairman up until about, I don't know, let's say three, four weeks ago and um, under the ownership of Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And um, uh, they both resigned recently um, for a whole lot of complicated reasons. But Aussie's been sold to another mob called Lendy, okay? Anyway, I was having lunch with James, having a mag. And the interesting thing about that is – many years ago in 2009, after I'd already sold Wizard to General Electric, but I was still the chairman of Wizard, GE, during the GFC, sold Wizard to Aussie Home Loans and CBA. And James said to me yesterday, and he's the first person who ever said it to me, I want to say to you, Mark, that John and I now know how you felt when yeah. Wizard was sold to us because we've just experienced the same thing now and it's not about money. You know, like I had plenty of money. John's got plenty of money. James got plenty of money. It's not about that. It's something that I, I felt lost. I, I, for in 2000 and beginning in 2009, uh, for the first period of 2009, which is, to be frank with you, is the reason I did The Apprentice. So the very first Apprentice, which wasn't a celebrity, it was a normal Apprentice, I did in July 2009 because I was lost and I didn't know what else to do. And someone offered me this opportunity to do a TV show and I thought, fuck it, I'll have a crack at it. Why yeah, it'd not? be fun. Why yeah, it'd not? be fun. Why not? It's got no downside for me. So, but James and John have just experienced the same thing. And as I said, it's not about the money you earn out of it. It's about the fact that you lose your purpose. Yes. You're not doing what you ordinarily do. And it takes a period of time. So I asked you that question because I was actually interested. What's getting you out of the bed? It ta correct. It takes you a period of time to adjust your whole thinking your whole physical bio, bio the biological self etc takes a long time to adjust. It took me three months i've never get i don't get depressed i never really felt depression to be honest with you except once before in my life when i left a really structured school environment i was only 17 i was pretty young went to university and the same thing i had this very same feeling when aussie bought wizard and it's funny they're going they're starting to get the same feeling now themselves and that's john simons he's in his 70s also it's the what next like I, i'm hardly well, about do? to yeah. pull up some business at 70 that's going to give me as you say the, the 90 deal. hours a week whatever yeah, yeah. i remember um hearing somebody in fact i think it was jeff kennett who spoke at a, a beyond blue yeah. function years ago that i was at and about the black dog yeah and he was talking about uh, with retirement you definitely need something 
whether you are about to create your garden or do a renovation or have something on the go because you need that reason to get out of bed every morning. And I think when you work like a dog, as, you know, pretty much everybody I know does, we have this image of, oh, retirement's going to be doing nothing, I can sleep in, I can get up. But Play golf. The thrill of that uh, stops after about two weeks. It's like being on holidays. Dan and I never go on holidays longer than seven days. Yeah, no, totally. Unless it's overseas because yeah. all of a sudden I'm just like, get me home. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because my, because the the brain's emptied out, all the new ideas are coming in and now I want to get them happening. And, and by the way, that doesn't mean you can't relax. Because you know, no. people look at me, I, I can't do more than 10 days on holiday away, you know what I mean? And people say, well, you've got to learn to relax. No, no, I'm fucking, I am relaxed. I've actually had seven, eight days off. I'm happy. Yeah. I, I want to get back to doing, doing what I do. It's yes. not, I'm not obsessed. Maybe I am, but I like doing what I'm doing. Like it's pretty cool. You're the same? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, long holidays. Well, don't you worry then about when you retire because I'm worried. Oh, I get a sore back then. Oh, so we had 33 weeks of lockdown in our houses last year. Let me tell you, talk about a new lesson in self-motivating. Like if I'm not seeing the trainer twice a week, I mean, hmm, whoopsie, forget to do stuff. So seeing the trainer makes me do it. But during lockdown for 33 weeks in Melbourne, there wasn't that luxury. Yeah, because you really guys got really So you either in there. like that, where you're like, oh, I reckon this this lower back's going to be pretty sore after my five weeks lying like that, or however <laughs> long it's going to be. Got nothing else I've watched on Netflix and stand there. And done I think it all. it's the same with retirement. I think you got to you got to keep those joints moving. So it's whether it's taking up bowls, which can't like all this stuff is. Fun. But that is reinventing yourself. So you know, reinventing your life. It's a fucking hard thing. Um, but what do you think? Let's look at digital platforms. But what do you think that people want to get from Julian Morris? I mean, I mean, obviously they want to laugh, giggle, but um, I think you want a Ford Scout to tell you how it's going to be when you get there. Yeah, and the um, through like I say, for example, I had my um, vaccine yesterday, my shot. And I noticed in the feed last night, because I put a photo up, some people were very cross. They're like, good luck with exploding from protein in the next few weeks. And oh, The anti is it. You're just like, come on, knuckle, keep on moving. And then somebody wrote, oh, I hear celebrities being paid big money uh, to, get a, to post about the oh, vaccine. Fuck. You're like, where is the money? Yeah. I'll be more than happy. Who do I contact? And I was sort of saying, I'm not doing this to encourage others to do it. I mean, I'm posting because I'm proud of myself. So. I think, and you're generous enough to share that. Yes. So then, it was a few things down the line where people are saying, "Can you let us know honestly how you, how it rolls out, how yeah, you feel?" Because so, people let like me, I want to know. Totally. I'm the next couple of days. While I don't want to stop anyone from getting it, I'm going to definitely talk about. Oh my god, it did feel like I had the flu for about five hours. So that's honest. I'm not trying to put anybody off having it. I'm not trying to get anyone to have it. But I like the forward scout vibe of I did this. You don't have to, but if you want to, this is what I, this is what, how I experienced it. And I feel like that in life everywhere. I'm at a concert. This is how I experienced it. So my posting is not, I'd like to think, virtue signaling. Oh, my God, guys, I live the most amazing life. It'll be like the other day. Oh, my God, Mark, I did this. So a friend came around, shared this new product. She's kind of chipping away. I'm like, you know, I'm going to do a live about that because I'm so bad at, I didn't know what any of the stuff was for. And I thought it might be funny for me to go, what is that? And as, as I started to unbox whatever it was, because of where the comments are in live Instagram, all the com- comments were hiding. I'm like a tire around my middle. And, and then I got all overheated, took my jumper off and had a white t-shirt on. I mean, thank God I had a bra on. So all of a sudden you've just got this like weird Michelin man and I'm like, hey, guys, all confident. And then when I watched it back after it had gone live, I'm like, why did I just pull the camera up slightly? But that also really appeals to loads of Australians who aren't tight and size 10. Yeah, yeah. Which is a huge amount of the population. Well, I, 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 again, okay, I, I, if I, I wouldn't mind sharing this with you, um, yeah. if you don't mind, um, and just from an observation today because I haven't caught up with you for ages, but... I mean, the the story you told about before about women in their, you know, 49 to 55 period when they sort of get to the pinnacle of their business life, and just by way of example, yours is as a performer, but everybody's got different 
do different things, but they all can. You can get to the pinnacle of that period because it's taken thirty years to uh, refine your craft and your skill. Um, but you still have enough energy at that point to be able to, to and to, for to, others to, to admire where you're, and up then to, to be able too. to say yes. But by the way, you just said it before, forward scout in the jungle. But by the way, just look out for this because you get the thing called menopause, and you know yes. shit's, shit's going to happen. But this is what you got to do. And by the way, I'm Julie Morris, and I went and saw a psychologist who helped me deal with this and. Because what I see is, I think it's really cool. Like you said, a forward scout as to what's going to happen for maybe a young, slightly younger generation behind you, or people in a, just a different stage behind you. Women in business could be men too, but women in business particularly. But you do it with comedy and honesty, um, and that's pretty cool. Like that's a great thing to be able to do going forward. Oh, and I like the idea of it, um, men hearing a story about going nuts. Because yeah, sometimes I like to. I'm sure men are kind of like. This fucking woman is nuts. Yeah. But if you can start to have a better under, of course, um, certainly menopause, until recently, where everyone's talking about, hey guys, I'm talking about it. Hey guys, here's like, this is, here's how it starts. You know, like <laughs> everyone's gone quite honest lately, but for a long time, there was definitely a divide between men and women where the men weren't allowed to say, this woman is nuts. The woman's not nuts. It's just this one period of time. Where I promise you, you're, it's an out of body experience, is how weird it is. I can be like getting furious about something, but also still be observing myself thinking, fucking hell, I'm pretty angry. So it's a, uh, if in any way those jokes give men an education to be like, can you just go easy on us for this bit? Because I promise you it's not going to last. I'd be interested to see what the stats are on, on couples that break up. At that time, because you know, and again, not all women experience it, but it, I would be fascinated to see if that's the one time where you think your wife's completely gone off the deep end, and yet you, you, we are coming back as just who is patient enough to tolerate that for two or three years. So I reckon over the last hour or so, you and I have uh, sort of, um, um, mostly you. I mean, I'm just listening, but uh, sort of uh, worked out what. Julia could do one day. I mean, I mean, all the platforms you used to do it. You don't have to have a TV show to do it. But like, just telling people honestly and in a funny way where you take the piss out of yourself, just like the the book, which is a piss tape. But but also, there's a lot of seriousness to be learned from it. A lot of important lessons to be learned from it. What it looks like for people in business, women in business, um, and the and the sorts of things you got to look out for. And the and the and there's no. There's no right answer for these things. The most important uh, how to deal with it. You have to deal with the way you want to deal with it and how you're best equipped to deal with it. Yeah. Husband, if you've got a partner, or if you've got an agent, if you can afford a psychologist, whatever it is. But this is what the shit you've got to look out for. Totally. This and is how what are you going to adapt? Yeah. Like, oh, I didn't get that right or I probably shouldn't have posted that or I shouldn't have done that. But how am I going to adapt now? It's, it's interesting watching comedians uh, around my age who have been around since all sorts of jokes were allowed to be told is, you know, but you're like, okay, well, if you were telling daggy jokes back in the 80s and 90s, how are you adapting for now? And it's that adaptation and I assume that's the same in business. Totally. Is it either mistakes or what you've learned, how do I adapt to go to the next bit and and being okay with hearing I mean, feedback drives me nuts. What about when you buy a coffee and you get an email and people are like, hey, um, you bought a coffee from us today. We'd just like some feedback. Yeah, get fucked is my feedback. Please don't contact me on my email. <laughs> I wouldn't write that, but that's what I would be thinking on the day. Yeah, well, you, well and I want to ask you one more question. Is it true that Julia Morris is too nice? No. I don't think so, so at is, all. So is there a strong, well, no, there's definitely a strong uh, side. Maybe. Is there is a firm side of you? Oh, yeah. First half of my life, yes, I would have driven towards being, you know, actively trying to make everyone think I'm okay, which I've now learnt yeah, in psychological terms is about the ego controlling how you feel about me. Mm. So in the second half of my life, um, I think it's about, honesty and about um, if something is wrong, I'm allowed, I'm allowed to have a word. It doesn't all have to be sweetness and light because that's bullshit. Mm. And or you're being dishonest then. Yeah. Or I tell you what's a punish is calling out stuff when you're at work from the uh, male-female perspective where, where I was like, say, for example, one year we went away, uh, it was one of our first years in Africa, and they gave the doctor 
this enormous big four wheel drive, and they gave me a ladies' town car, like a little t- like a beep beep barina or something. So I was sort of like, um, so is the doctor covering different terrain to me? Because from what I can see, we're all out in the, you know, we're out in the low veld of, of uh, South Africa up near Kruger National Park. I'm not convinced he's going to be covering much more different terrain than me. Why have I got a lady's car and he's got the big four-wheel drive? And they're like, oh, we just thought that, um, and I did, did you not think I could drive a big car? So all of a sudden I'm sounding like the punish, calling out shit like that. But let me tell you, the next year, same car, next show that all those people work on, guess what? The lady who goes behind me, she will have something even, I hope. So again with the Ford, on the Ford Scout kind of vibe, is call, without being a punish the entire time, is calling out things when I see them now and because of the position I've got in the industry at the moment. Well, it's your obligation. I'm allowed to. But no, it's your obligation. Absolutely. As a strong, as a strong successful woman, as any woman should do, but, but you're, you've got a platform, so you need to call it out. Because yeah. if you don't know anyone else. In years gone by, I wouldn't have even noticed. Uh, it's not that I wouldn't have noticed to call it out. If that was something was sexually inappropriate or I'm a, I would have, I've always been outspoken. But these days, even the tiny little nuances of uh, even in the workplace, I'll, I'll, I'll be calling it. Cool. Oh, yeah. we're we doing that joke, are we? Oh, okay. Oh, so women are idiots and men are all right. All right. Interesting. I'm interested. To but be- what's, what's weird about that too, by the way? Why wouldn't a woman love to drive the same car? Love to drive it, not just can drive it, but oh. love to drive it. Um, I'm going to drive it like wheels on it. driving toothpaste out of a tube. <laughs> I will be fanging it at every available opportunity. Yeah, because it's fun. What in me fucking barina? Yeah, I love the barina. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, makes you feel like you're driving a birthing suite. Well, when so <laughs> when, when you got <laughs> when when they got a choice and they got budgets, I, I want to drive a cool car. Yeah. That's a fun – because you're in terrain. Like you want to drive a fun cool car on terrain. Like why well, not? Well, interesting being in South Africa with a doctor as well. So it's like not only have you got lady man, but then you've got lady doctor. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, what were the doctor like for dinner? We had in the first year because we were working such psycho hours where they had a, a, a chef come and, and have our meal ready at night. And then the chef would say – I mean that sounds terribly – Fancy, but we were literally doing, you know, 17-hour well, days. We've got someone to cook your meal. That's, yeah. we're all, it was just so – we were so tired to even eat. Anyway, then um, after dinner the chef said, what would the doctor like for dinner tomorrow night? I'm like, the doctor would like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the doctor's like, oh, yeah, chicken would be great. But do, do you ever feel as though yeah, – saying that sort of thing, do you ever think, think to yourself, well, people won't like me? If I yeah, say that? and they don't. And what do you say? Who gives a fuck? I'm – at who gives a fuck now, but I didn't have the luxury of being allowed to who gives a fuck in years gone by. I'd be lucky to keep my job if you spoke up too much. So, yeah, being a little bit older, having the confidence and trying to deliver it in a kind way where you're like, um, sorry, but, you know, the, yeah, the girls are going to need a bathroom up in the studio. So Oh, yeah, hello. You go, whoa, whoa, what am I going in the bushes? Yeah. I don't have that sort of direct, directional facility. <laughs> Where, what? Did it go too far? It felt like no, it went too far. No, no, no. It, it, well, it, it, went, it went the distance with Julie Morris. And, and I think, look, I, my gut feeling is I think Julie Morris can pretty much do or say anything she wants. I think so. And uh, for me also that represents an amazing opportunity for you because somehow you have this ability to – Make it sound funny, irreverent, and funny, but not offensive at the same time. And I had a friend say not long ago, he said, uh, "So Brendan Burns, a global comedian, and he sent me a message saying, when I think about you, I just want you to know this out of the blue, apropos of nothing.' He said, "I feel like you are a sort of human being who walks into a room, finds the line, and then dances on it for the yeah. rest of the night. But I never go over the line." I'd like to think I don't in terms of decency, in terms of fairness, in terms of uh, sexism, racism, any of those things that have been used in comedy in the past. I've got no business with that. All I want everyone to be doing is having fun. We're, 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 how are we laughing? Let's put some more laughter in because it's great pursuit of happiness as well. We're all trying to pursue more happiness. But I think I found the secret. It, it's not 
the pursuit of happiness. It's more laughter in each day. So how do I get more laughter into my day? Into your day and everyone else's day. Everybody's day. day. Well, that'll do me. Julie Morris, that was fucking wonderful. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you.